A heads up, this episode starts with a story of pregnancy loss. I'm Julia Longoria. This is More Perfect. How old were you when you got pregnant for the first time? Today's episode comes from producer Gabrielle Burbet. I was 30, uh, 34. I was 34. And it starts with a woman named Margot. She's never set foot in the Supreme Court. But in 2014, when Roe v. Wade was still law, her first pregnancy made her confront a line the court drew. That story began when she was about nine weeks pregnant. So at nine weeks uh, was when I started writing weekly letters to my baby. What kind of stuff would you write? I think I talked about snapdragons and how you can make them open like mouths. And so how excited I was to, you know, like show her how to do that. How you, when you squeeze the sides of snapdragon's mouth, uh, you can make them talk. I kept up the, the, the weekly letters until I ran out of pages in that journal. Then, at 18 weeks, the trouble began. One of the ventricles in her brain was measuring on the high side of the normal range. The scan showed that something was wrong with her baby's brain development. So doctors asked her to come back in a few weeks for a follow-up scan. By 22 weeks, it was in the severe range and there were other abnormalities. When somebody brought up abortion, that made it clear to me that what was going on was real bad. I mean, every one of them knew that I wanted that baby. They knew there was a chance her baby had a rare congenital brain disease. But it was too early for a diagnosis, and they didn't know how severe it would be. The big thing that we were waiting for at that point was the information that the MRI could give us about the brain development a month down the line. In one month, scans could tell her a lot more about her baby's quality of life. Either the complications were so great that she would die before she was born or immediately after birth or never leave a hospital kind of stuff. And they just couldn't say at that point. But the problem was, in a month, it would be too late. I was told that if I wanted an abortion, I needed to decide right then and I didn't have enough information. She was 22 weeks pregnant then. In just two weeks, at the 24-week mark, it would be too late to have an abortion because of a line the Supreme Court drew in 1973 in Roe v. Wade. The viability line. That's the point in a pregnancy when a baby could theoretically survive outside the womb. Biologically, it's a fuzzy line. It's impossible for doctors to declare the viability of any pregnancy with certainty. In Roe v. Wade, though, viability was the cutoff. Before the line, abortion was legal. After the line, it was up to states to legalize it or ban it. Margot lived in Michigan, where abortion is banned after viability. And her hospital wouldn't perform an abortion after 24 weeks. You're telling me that if in two weeks you tell me that my baby has a fatal disease, you can't help me? She couldn't possibly make a decision about having an abortion in that moment. I knew I just didn't have enough information. Being so afraid of not being able to get an abortion later that you have an abortion even not know, oh God, no. But the thought of making her baby suffer down the line was also unbearable. There's obviously no medical reason for that, right? Like all of the reasons for that happening are legal and they're not sense-making legality, right? This is nonsense legality, because nobody thinks that this is a good scenario. (laughs) So how did we end up here? What has been missed? We will hear argument this morning in case 19-1392, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. In the oral argument for Dobbs, the case that overturned Roe, The word abortion came up 73 times. The word precedent, 24 times. Privacy, 10. But viability? And we asked the court to at least get rid of a viability line or any suggestion of a viability line. So a viability, it seems to me, doesn't... Or viability. Other than viability. That basic viability line. 
111 times. The line really doesn't make any sense. Viability is not tethered to anything in the Constitution. Viability is a principled line, Your Honor, because in ordering the interest... To the viability line was the line that protected the constitutional right to most abortions for 50 years. But in Dobbs... You want us to reject that line of viability and adopt something different. The line was thrown out. However you might feel about abortion, there's no question Dobbs has thrown abortion law in America into a state of chaos. State laws are changing across the country at a breakneck speed. Politicians are deciding where they'll draw their own lines at any point in a pregnancy. Arizona, 15 weeks. Georgia, six weeks. In 14 other states, conception. Today on More Perfect, the story of the very first line, the viability line, how it went on to transform everything, from who can have an abortion, to the way doctors practice medicine, even to the way we understand pregnancy. It's a line that's so embedded itself in our culture, not even the Supreme Court can erase it. This is More Perfect. I'm Julia Longoria. Reporter Gabrielle Burbe set out to trace the origin of the viability line in Roe v. Wade. The decision in that case was written by a justice named Harry Blackman. But my question was, where did Justice Blackman get the idea for the viability line? First, I pulled up the opinion online, Control-F, viability, to see if he explained why he chose that line. He didn't. That would have made for a short episode. <laughs> yeah, wrap it up. Where, where did you go next? <laughs> um, so then I had to go deeper. And luckily, shortly before Justice Blackman died, he gave his papers over to the Library of Congress. So I went there. And there were 1,576 boxes of papers that Justice Blackman donated. Um, so I was sifting through all of these boxes and found stuff like a box of mostly hate mail that Justice Blackman kept after the Roe v. Wade decision, um, letters to friends. The volume of stuff was totally overwhelming until I found a clue. <laughs> um, you had two files in Justice Blackman's clerk box. Were you particularly close? Well, you know, we yes, I was close to him because of the abortion case. Really, I mean, it's the foxhole camaraderie. It turns out Justice Blackman spent many, many hours in the foxhole writing Roe v. Wade with one clerk. George Frampton, I clerk for Justice Blackman in the Supreme Court. George was a clerk who stayed on an extra summer after his clerkship to help draft Roe v. Wade. But he was quick to tell me he was not Blackman's teacher's pet. When he first got the job, he didn't even want to work for Justice Blackman. I was thinking, how can I go to work for a newly minted Nixon conservative justice? In fact, when he first visited the court as a law student— he was not impressed. It sort of looked like a second-rate train station. I mean, really old white guys who didn't seem to be paying any attention to much. And I was horrified. But as a lawyer, fresh out of law school, with an offer from a Supreme Court justice, you just don't turn that down. What exactly do clerks do? Well, a big part of law clerks' job is the equivalent of cleaning out the stables every morning so the horses can run. The horses being the justices. Clerks do the research judges need to make their decisions. Here's the case. Here are the facts. Here's the law. Here's some questions to ask. And George says on off hours, they also sometimes hang out with the justices. You know, every once in a while, Justice White played basketball with the law clerks. And he always cheated. He was mean. He would hit you with his elbow. He was a dirty player, you know. That was not Blackman. Blackman was softer. 
And George found that despite all his skepticism for the court, he liked his boss. He was so informal. He would have breakfast almost every morning with the clerks in the cafeteria. Blackman would order the same thing every day, a scrambled egg and raisin toast. Most people were tourists or, you know, came to the cafeteria, had no idea. One of the justices was sitting down there with a bunch of young lawyers. He was a very down-to-earth, modest person who cared much more about what the law's impact was on ordinary people than he did on legal theology or legal ideology. And I think, you know, came to the court with a lot of anxiety about whether he was going to be up to it. When it came time to pick which justice would write the controversial opinion of Roe v. Wade, the chief justice at the time chose Justice Blackman. Now, we don't know exactly why, but it's not hard to imagine some reasons. Blackman knew something about medicine. He'd previously served as the legal counsel for the Mayo Clinic in his home state of Minnesota. And he was a centrist. Even though he was appointed by Nixon, he wasn't a Nixon yes man. He was a diplomat who could write an opinion that the most number of justices split on this issue would sign on to. During summer recess of 1972, Blackman holed up in the Mayo Clinic library, poring over books about the history of abortion. But he wasn't on his own. So I was in Washington. He had the help of his clerk, George. And I was looking at facts, and he was referring me to things, too, to look at. We did talk on the telephone, maybe once every week or 10 days. Justice Blackman took his first crack at an opinion. The opinion he circulated was pretty thin, Uh, He didn't really resolve the issue of the extent to which abortion was a constitutionally protected choice. It sort of flirted with that idea, but didn't come right out and say it. And so he commissioned me to write something that would do that. So it was George's turn to give it a shot. He was tasked with finding the strongest constitutional case for some right to an abortion. And the way he saw it, there were two competing rights at play. The courts were never going to say that unborn fetus from the time of conception is a a person who has full constitutional rights. That's not something that our judicial system is ever going to recognize. On the other hand, we can't let a woman decide at eight and a half months to end a pregnancy and terminate the potential life of her fetus, child, that's a little too much to to contemplate. You're going to have to find a compromise in the middle someplace. That's just inevitable. Now, the idea that people would get an abortion on a whim at eight and a half months is just not true in a practical sense. It does not happen. It's a misconception that pops up, especially in politicized conversations about abortion. But for better or for worse, at the time he was drafting Roe, George was thinking about pregnancy and abortion in more theoretical legal terms, trying to balance the interests of two parties. And he wrote to Justice Blackman with a suggested edit. And that was the note that I found at the Library of Congress in George's clerk box. (laughs) It's been a long time since I've seen this. George hadn't seen this note since he wrote it over 50 years ago. It really is like seeing your, you know, self come back alive. I'm wondering if you can read that part just out loud. I have written essentially a limitation of the right, depending on the time during pregnancy when the abortion is proposed to be performed. I've chosen the point of viability for this turning point when state interests become competing for several reasons. George said to Blackman, how about we use the point in the middle of a pregnancy called viability as the line where the state's interest outweighs that of the pregnant person and states can ban abortion after that point. That's part of my sales pitch. Did Justice Blackman get viability from your proposal in that memo? I assume so. Where did you get the term viability? Well, it's a, it, was, it's, it was very much a part of all the medical literature and I think a part of the legal 
background. It was hard to chase down that legal background. From what I could tell, there was nothing published about viability in abortion law when George was writing his letters. But at around the same time, there was one other judge holed up in his chambers looking at viability in a different abortion case in the lower courts. Not sure the case has been decided. I would be very happy if, <laughs> if it were before this. Why, why would you be happy? Well, because at least I'm not making it up. Actually, just can you just start with introducing yourself and saying who you are and what you do? Uh, my name is John Newman. I'm a senior judge of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Newman introduced viability into abortion law in a lower court. But his opinion came out a few months after George wrote about viability in his private letters to black men. The case came to me in 1972, just two months after I had been appointed. When an abortion case landed on his desk a year before the Roe decision, he, like black men, was a bit of a centrist. The swing vote on the Second Circuit. The appellate judge thought it was a fairly clear case and the state could not regulate abortions at all. But the second judge... He took the view that um, the state could ban all abortions. Which left Judge Newman the tiebreaker. I was the third judge and didn't accept either absolute view. Judge Newman was wrestling with the same question as George. Both of them felt if they were going to make abortion legal, it can't be all or nothing. We've got to pick a line. And so I suggested the line of viability as the dividing line. If the fetus could not become a human being outside the womb, it seemed to me the state interest did not outweigh the private interest of the woman. And um, I just thought, you can't abolish her right, but you can limit it. And so where to limit it was then the issue, and the viability line seemed to me the sensible line. Well, why did it make sense to you at that time? You have to use some judgment. Uh, there's no magic to it. People use judgment in their daily lives all the time. I don't know that anybody knows exactly why they decided anything. Who to marry, what college to go to, what job to take, any, any of those big life decisions. Did you talk to doctors or OBGYNs in trying to figure out what made sense? No. Um, when, when any judge decides a case, you decide it based on the record. You don't go out and talk to other people, even experts. So these judges are drawing medical lines in the sand, and they're not even required to consult a doctor? Well, this isn't trial court, so they're not hearing from experts on a stand like you see in Law & Order. <laughs> but we do know that Judge Newman did have an affidavit from a doctor that referenced the viability line. Hello? Hi, um, is Virginia there? Producer Alyssa Eads tracked down the only doctor Judge Newman cited in his opinion. This is she. Dr. Virginia Sturmer. She's 99, so she's no longer practicing. Hi, Virginia. My name is Alyssa Eads. Um, I'm calling from WNYC, the public radio station in New York. She had the TV on when Alyssa called. I truly don't want to listen to a pitch, but I will send the check. Oh, I'm not <laughs> okay. calling. I'm not calling. <laughs> It was a cold call. Oh, my God. I'm trying to figure out where the concept of viability came from. Um, what came from? <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know where that came from. But. All Judge Newman cited from Dr. Snurmer's affidavit was about where viability is in a pregnancy, not how it should be applied to the law. She did tell us, though, personally— she wouldn't feel comfortable performing an abortion after 20 weeks. But that's not any scientific thing. I spoke to doctors and a medical sociologist to understand how the viability line is used in medical practice. Around 23 weeks is the point at which the lungs of a fetus may be developed enough that a baby born could breathe with a ton of help. But that's not the only factor doctors use to determine if a fetus is viable. There's no such thing as a viability test. 
In fact, it's not uncommon for two doctors to disagree about whether a fetus is viable. So Justice Blackman took this fuzzy medical concept from the realm of prenatal care and turned it into a legal cutoff to define abortion care. Doctors have pushed back hard, saying that the line is telling them how to practice medicine and that it ignores scientific evidence. For this reason, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists actually opposes abortion legislation or regulation that uses viability as its standard. And the justices themselves have also had their doubts. Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman on the court, worried that using the viability line put the justices, quote, in the business of being in a science review board. I disagree with that. Judge Newman again. We will be doing what judges do in all cases and assessing the competing scientific views that are presented to us and deciding which one we think is more persuasive. We have to do that in patent cases, copyright cases, environmental cases, all the time. So there's nothing special about doing that in an abortion case. The fact that the doctors can't opine with certainty whether at a certain point the fetus is or is not viable doesn't distress me at all. No line is going to yield perfect results. No legal doctrine is going to lead uh, or even entirely consistent results. The law is imperfect just as life is. That doesn't bother me. And I would rather accept a few imperfections than be forced into all or nothing decisions. Judge Newman repeated this again and again in our conversation. Judges have to pick lines. That's what judges do. Viability as a measure of when you can say that potential life becomes more lifelike, more real life. It seems to me you can say, well, that's the grossest, clumsiest reading, but it's also pretty simple. George, Blackman's clerk, he agrees. At some point, if you think that the state has an interest in preventing a woman from having an abortion at nine months, and you also think that life is not fully protected at conception, then you have to pick a point. And the justices deciding Roe v. Wade were also searching for a point. Justice Blackman actually didn't take up George's proposal for viability at first— Blackman agreed the state had an interest in protecting fetal life at some point in a pregnancy, but thought the 12-week point was more convincing. So he drew the line there at the first trimester. He wrote to the other justices and said, quote, This is arbitrary, but perhaps any other selected point, such as quickening or viability, is equally arbitrary. Justice Powell pointed to Judge Newman's opinion, which had just come out, and said, I'd go with viability. Then Douglas comes back and says, first trimester is better. Marshall steps in and is like, absolutely not. Another vote for viability. And Brennan is like, viability is okay with me, so long as we're clear about the reasoning here. This is not about the woman. It's about the state's interest in protecting fetal life. And Blackman never stops having his doubts. But what seems to draw him back to the viability line is this. Could this arbitrary point be good enough to command a court? In other words, is this the best compromise for these nine men? Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. The majority. And ultimately, it was. Roe v. Wade was a 7-2 to two opinion. It read, quote, A person may choose to have an abortion until a fetus becomes viable. The court's decision, written by Justice Blackman, thus sets limits on the right to abortion on demand. One limit is the time when doctors believe the fetus may be able to survive outside the mother's womb. At that point, usually... This was a real win for abortion rights. But as soon as the decision came down, something else happened. The goal was always to overturn Roe versus Wade. And the viability line is a a very easy target. After the break, 
leaders in the anti-abortion movement converge, with their sights set on Roe's weakest link. From WNYC Studios, this is More Perfect. I'm Julia Longoria. Viability is a principled line, Your Honor, because in ordering the well, I'm interest... trying to see whether it is a principled line. What viability, a line in a pregnancy drawn by a clerk and a couple of judges in the 70s, was at the center of Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. Mississippi tried to pass a ban on abortions before viability, which would violate Roe. But Justice Samuel Alito pointed out, viability isn't some magical line where the pregnant person's right to choose stops or the interest in protecting a fetal life begins. Don't those things exist at every moment in the pregnancy? But yeah, you be- agree with me at least on that point, that a, a woman still has the same interest in terminating her pregnancy after the viability line has been crossed. Yes, Your Honor, but the court balanced the interest and in okay. ordering and the interest state. And then look at, at the state. interest on, on the other side. The, the fetus has an interest in having a life, and that doesn't change, does it, from the point before viability to the point after viability? In the opinion, Justice Alito wrote that, quote, the viability line makes no sense, and promptly destroyed it at the federal constitutional level. He said it was not adequately justified in Roe, and even the dissenters to Dobbs don't try to defend it. But for 50 years before this, the viability line lived as constitutional law. And in that time, it embedded itself in our culture so deeply that even though viability seemed to show up out of nowhere, it came to define the entire conversation about abortion on both sides. Gabrielle Burbe has the rest of the story. As soon as Roe v. Wade came down, the viability line came to take on a kind of moral significance. The National Right to Life Committee is opposed to Roe v. Wade. We believe. Is it okay for us to allow unviable uh, infants to be left to die? Viability, by definition, means that the child can survive outside the body of the mother. Then why kill the child? On the conservative Christian right, viability was an easy target. The line, as a cutoff point, was condemned as immoral. No matter how you define these terms, you can say fetus, you can talk about viability and medical procedure and abortion, you can talk about all these words, but it boils down to children, innocent, unborn children. And they build a movement around teaching people its flaws. Around the age of 12, I read a book called Pro-Life Answers to Pro-Choice Arguments. Alex Harris learned about viability as a kid. So the book reads, In Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court defined viability as the point when the unborn is, quote, potentially able to live outside the mother's womb, but why not say he becomes human in the fourth week because that's when his heart beats, or the sixth week because that's when he has brain waves. Both are also arbitrary, yet both would eliminate all abortions currently performed. He's a lawyer now, but when he was younger... Alex was sometimes referred to as a Jonas Brother of the evangelical movement. I'm picturing you on a stage with like a headset with cool hair, pumping up a crowd of evangelical teens. Is that? We we did do that. We had these big foam rocket launchers (laughs) that we would shoot into the crowd to give away copies of dense theological books to, to teenagers. His parents were pioneers in the Christian homeschool world part of a larger movement called the Joshua Generation. The movement trained kids in debate, public speaking, political campaigning, all before they were even teenagers. And all of this was to prepare us to be the senators and the U.S. Supreme Court justices and the presidents of our generation. And really, the vision was to take the land for Christ and for conservative values. Alex made it to the Supreme Court as a clerk for Justice Kennedy. He also clerked for Justice Gorsuch when he was still in the lower court. And his very first gig 
was interning for an anti-abortion judge in Alabama, who, long before Dobbs, worked to tear down viability in the lower courts. He was known for writing opinions where he would identify, you know, all the, the many ways that the law does confer rights and protections on a fetus to kind of build the argument for why the fetus should be identified and recognized as a person and why Roe was therefore wrongly decided. The goal was to protect life from the moment of conception and ban all abortions. In response to those attacks, abortion advocates and Democratic lawmakers, they ended up doubling down on viability. We have laws in this land. We have court decisions in this land. Before viability, in the early stages of a pregnancy, a woman gets to decide with her family and her doctor and with her God what her options are. I believe that abortions post-viability should not take place, except in the rarest of exceptions. We say after the fetus is viable, no abortion, no procedure. To secure the survival of Roe, Democratic lawmakers tried to make viability stronger by attempting to write it into federal laws. But they never stopped to question if it even made sense. After a couple of decades of people repeating viability, viability as like this magical point in the pregnancy, Mm -hmm. I think that it made sense at that point to give viability even more magic. This is Kiara Bridges professor of law at UC Berkeley School of Law. I think that viability has become a point that many, many, many people across the political spectrum believe to be the point at which abortion is immoral and therefore ought to be illegal. Like, we want to match up morality with legality. She says viability, which... To be clear, was not a word in the national abortion discussion before Roe v. Wade is now how the majority of Americans understand abortion morally. Even people who are, you know, supportive of abortion rights, we don't subject viability to critique because it seems the logical point at which people can be compelled to give birth But I mean, I think that what's obvious is folks are left out of that, right? People who need and get abortions after viability, young people, poor people, people surviving, you know, intimate violence, um, people's lives on the ground are so much messier than what the court pretends people's lives look like. When the viability line was drawn, it didn't change the fact that some people still seek later abortions. What it did do was make access to care even more difficult, if not impossible. I understand why viability feels meaningful and significant and big, but when I try to pin it down, it feels quite slippery and small in comparison to the things that I really care about. This is Margot again, the woman who wrote to her unborn daughter about showing her the snapdragons. This is from um, December 8th, 2014. I was 27 weeks, four days pregnant. And all the letters uh, at this part were to Dear Future Kid. She was waiting for test results that would clarify her daughter's brain condition. And she ran out of time in her state to have an abortion because her pregnancy crossed the viability line. At the follow-up ultrasound last Friday, they found that the ventricles in your brain have increased to 14 to 15 millimeters on the right, which is nearly twice what's considered normal. Margot lived in Michigan. Following Roe, Michigan allowed abortions before viability but banned them after that line. So when Marco decided she did need to have an abortion, her doctors told her she would need to travel to a state that did allow the procedure after viability. In this case, Colorado. The clinic she went to is one of the few in the country that would do an abortion in the third trimester. She says it looked like a bunker, 
designed to protect the staff and patients from bomb threats and shootings. I don't know how many cases of later abortion were looked at before people decided to try to write laws that said they couldn't happen. But it seems to me like that's the sort of thing you would want to do, (laughs) Um, is not come up with a theoretical, like, pull it out of the sky. Judges drew the viability line because, they said, they had to balance two opposing interests. It was the person's right to choose versus the state's interest in protecting fetal life. For me, she was always a kind of life worth protecting. I wanted her to live. I spoke with several women who had later abortions and later abortion providers, and they all said the same thing. What did people think they were preventing when they wrote the law the way they did? How does this line actually function in people's lives? I think I always go back to, we have to look at what drives someone to have an abortion, and why is that person at 26, 27, 28 weeks desperate to have an abortion? What are the circumstances? That's the key. I think the only thing that the line did was make me afraid that there was a clock that was about to run out. The people who ended up on the other side of the line, or even close to it, they found themselves alone. I didn't know where to go. I didn't feel like there was any kind of help for processing that grief. I remember feeling that the abortion that I had, because it was later, that it was the worst abortion, that it was less justified, that it was morally less okay. Roe is the floor. But I never thought it was a good decision to begin with. Why did they do this? They screwed us all over. I wanted to go back to the people who drew this line in the first place to ask them what they meant it to be. Did you see it as a moral line? No. No. Judge Newman again. It's not up to courts to, uh, to make uh, moral decisions uh, in a case. We are not the clergy. I am obliged to interpret the Constitution. Whatever our views of morality is, we ought not to impose them on others. Would you do anything differently, knowing what you know now? Well, I I don't look back. Uh, (laughs) Why do you laugh? (laughs) Uh, Judges have enough to do with with the case that's on for today and the case that's coming up next week. And I don't think it's a a good use of their time to go back and say, would I have done it differently 50 years ago? I've never sort of felt too much of a reason to go out and defend it in the sense that... George Frampton, Blackman's clerk. It is what it is, was what it was. It worked to the extent that it's become a thorn, a disadvantage in the abortion debate. I'd never thought that much about it. I guess I just thought, well, it's always been vulnerable. But as long as it's out there, at least it's guaranteeing most people the right to an abortion. Yeah. And so you still feel that viability is the one that that makes the most sense? No, not today. Why not? I don't have any particular pride in the brilliance of, you know, the original Roe v. Wade uh, decision. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I never really thought about the viability of viability. You know, there's nothing magical about viability. If you want a rule of law, you have to pick a line. If there is a point someplace in the middle and you can't use viability or quickening and you can't use a number of months as an approximation, how do you articulate the right to build the law on? to build a whole legal and health system on. Tell me what you think it's going to be. Abortion law was built on the assumptions of men. What they did and didn't understand about medicine, 
about pregnancy, about loss. Liberals who supported abortion rights used that law, tried to make it stronger, and in doing so, made those assumptions part of how the majority of Americans understand abortion. Conservatives focused their attention on that law to destroy it, to fight for a new legal and health system. And they won. When Dobbs was decided, did that feel like an accomplishment? You know, it really felt surreal in many ways. I went back to Alex Harris, the Jonas Brother of the movement that helped destroy the viability line in federal law. But there was not the jubilation that I think I may have felt even 10 years prior. Most of that was just my greater understanding of how this decision uh, would impact the lives of so many women, um, including women in my own life. Mm. The fear that I I knew and had heard and, and saw from so many of them in response to this decision. And if my hope and the hope of of true Christians and followers of Christ was in the Supreme Court to right all those wrongs, the brokenness of our world, the brokenness of our political system, the brokenness of our judicial system. It's not prepared to do that. And where do you see this going now that viability is gone? So we now don't have to defend viability. Our creativity has been unleashed. Right now, there are people who are looking for a new standard. We're starting to see the proliferation of arguments for abortion rights that don't rely on the due process clause, you know, equal protection arguments, free exercise arguments. Next week, part two. The Supreme Court asked for an alternative to viability. We go to the people looking for one. When does life begin? It begins at the beginning. A pregnancy is viable if it's wanted and accepted and embraced. I think most people who support abortion rights actually probably think there should be a line. Well, what if we don't? What if we just allow people to decide what it means to them? More Perfect is a production of WNYC Studios. This episode was produced by Gabrielle Burbet and me, Alyssa Eats, with editing by Jenny Lawton and Emily Siner. Fact check by Naomi Sharp. Special thanks this week to Jeannie Sook Gerson, Sam Moyne, Anna Sale, Lauren Cooperman, Erica Christensen, Garen Marshall, Katrina Kimport, Benedict Landgren, Nina Martin, and Glenn Halva Neubauer. Thanks also to Hilary Frank of The Longest, Shortest Time, where we first heard Margot's story, and to the Library of Congress for their help with Blackman's papers. The More Perfect team also includes Julia Longoria, Emily Botin, Whitney Jones, and Salman Ahad Khan. The show is sound designed by David Herman and mixed by Joe Plord. Our theme is by Alex Overington, and the episode art is by Candace Evers. If you want more stories about the Supreme Court, go to your podcast app, hit subscribe, and scroll back for more than two dozen episodes. Supreme Court Audio is from OEA, a free law project by Justia and the Legal Information Institute of Cornell Law School. Support for More Perfect is provided by the Smart Family Fund and by listeners like you. Thanks for listening. <laughs>